primary reason for the Sabbath is what? The primary reason. What is it for? It's our relationship with him. That's correct. It's because he gave us the Sabbath to celebrate what he had done. Um, I was listening to someone recently talking about the Sabbath, and it sounded like from their discourse over a period of 10, 15 minutes that the primary reason for the Sabbath was rest. I absolutely do not agree. Uh, the primary reason was to spend the time with God and recognize what he had done. Now, if you worked every day of the week, and then you had a birthday party for your spouse, what's the primary reason for taking the day off work to have the birthday party? What would be your primary reason? To get to the birthday Okay, or to have the birthday party. It wouldn't be to rest. It'd be for the party. <laughs> okay? So that's what the Sabbath is for. The Sabbath is our creation party. Ever think of it that way? We're having a party celebrating creation. Otherwise, if it weren't for creation, we wouldn't be here, would we? Then we wouldn't be able to celebrate it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started for our lesson. It's a very interesting and important one. So let's get started. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this lesson and the opportunity we have to be together, to be able to study. I just pray that you'll help each of us as we contribute to the things that, from the things that we have learned to each other, that we will all learn more. Send us your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to give us wisdom and insight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Growing in Christ. One of the things that it seems that we as Christians do plenty often is to talk about surrendering to Christ. And often we talk about it from the standpoint as though we were not Christians and we need to surrender. How often do we need to surrender? Every day. Every day. Moment by moment. Moment by moment. So you need to surrender as long as you are human. Because if you quit being human in the sense that we know it now, then you wouldn't need to, right? When we go to heaven, will we need to surrender? No, but I bet something's up there. No, but I bet something's up there. I think we will be surrendered and it will be able to stay in that condition. Here, our problem is is that self is too much of us. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Because in our sinful natures, we are too concerned about what we want. Now, what is love? Why does the room always go silent when I ask that question? <laughs> That's something that everybody's supposed to be an expert at. How many of you are married? <clears throat> or have been? There goes a couple more hands. Well, then you know all about it, right? Not Apparently not. Apparently not. <laughs> it's supposed to be an unconditional acceptance. Unconditional acceptance? Uh, I don't know if I can get this right, but let me think. Uh, the having an uh, object of your affection and having the means to... Uh, Bestow, I don't I remember how you put it, but I like it. <laughs> He's trying to quote my position, my, my definition. I like it, I think it's valuable. Um, to me, love is having resources, of course, and committing all of those resources to the object of your affection. So it's powerful. So it's what? Powerful. Very powerful. Very powerful. Let me state it another way. Love is committing you and all you have to the object of your love. So now when we write love here, and we say God loves me, we have God taking all of his resources committing them to me. 
So then I love That's the sinful nature. <clears throat> See, what it is, it's this right here. Except instead of it going this way and this way, instead, we mess up something here, and we go like this. Satan hasn't invented anything, has he? He just redirects it. So love... For God is to love somebody outside of himself, his creations. God uses all of his resources to support, maintain his creation. Man, when we sin, our love was reversed back to myself. Well, now you think about it. We don't need this down here. We can just say that love goes like this. You notice that's a pretty small circle? How do you get, how do you enlarge this circle? If it's only you loving yourself, what do you have in life? If everybody is taking care of themselves, who's taking care of others? How do the resources spread? They're not, whereas God takes all of his resources and keeps giving and giving and giving. God's method of supplying your need is that God also loves other people. Right? Mm -hmm. God loves us more than himself. Mm -hmm. So when he loves others, and others love God and others, now they're supplying your need. So God may give you what you need through somebody else. Not all that comes directly from him. For example, God even uses to give things to you. That's the thing. What if you didn't have air to breathe? Try and get that on your own. You ever tried to create your own air? You ever tried to create water? Create food? You can't do it. We have to get it from nature, don't we? All of the physical powers, resources that we need all come from nature. God put them there. What if God had not? Where would you be? You'd be part of nature called fertilizer in the ground. That's what you'd be. No life there for you, is there? So the bottom line is, is God is a giver. Now think of the human economy. The human economy is, the more I can get, the more I will have. God says, the more I can get, the more I can give. See the difference? Now, we're supposed to be talking about growing in Christ. How do I become larger? Can I do it this way? No. No. This is what the other religion wants you to do. Do you know what the other religion is? We've talked about it. What's the other religion? There's only two religions in the world. There's the one we're studying, that we study each week here. Truth from God's Word. What's the other one that's split into thousands of denominations? What would the other one be? Well, really, it's pretty simple. It's that I am the source of everything. I am God. You see, if we evolved, that, and there is no designer, then everything that's needed is in here. I have all the intelligence, all the wisdom, and it's just a matter of what can I do to get a hold of it and get control of it. You know, like meditation. Just empty the mind all out, and then truth and real wisdom you'll arrive at. You'll think of it. It'll come out. You know, it's all in there. You just got to get all this exterior out so that it can come in, so that you can be aware of it. Yeah, but he's putting it in. Oh, but now you've made a jump from what I said. 
I said, it'll come out. You'll hear it. You said, who put it in? See, and there's the dilemma, isn't it, Joe? There is somebody that can put it in, and it isn't in there. It isn't in there. If you think it's in there, let me ask you this. When did all the universe's wisdom get into your mind? Was it before you were 30? Maybe before you were 20? Was it all in there then? How about before you were 10? How about before you were born? Maybe it was at the moment of conception. Well, what were you before that? When did it get in there? Ha. Huh. Interesting. It's funny because nothing else got in there that way. You weren't born with good manners. You weren't born with character. That's all part of the developmental process. Well, guess what then? If we develop in our youth as a good worldly, that is, sinner, where and how do we become a good citizen for heaven? We're going to have to change our occupation. We're going to change our character. We're going to change our aims. We're going to have to change our objectives. Somehow we've got to break out of this circle. <clears throat> You remember the circle we talked about last week? Mm -hmm. What were the three parts of the circle? Choice. Starts in the mind. Our choices. Choices lead to actions or words, behaviors, all of that, the outward life. And the result of that is life or guilt or not guilt. The judgment comes in that end, and that leads us back to how we feel and how we react. <clears throat> Excuse me, that circle of life. Well, how do we get ourselves to improve that circle when we're caught up right here and we just love ourselves? There's no room for someone else here, is there? There isn't room for you to influence me, because I've got it all right here. There isn't room for the Bible to influence me. There isn't room for the Holy Spirit to influence me. Because I'm all wound up in my own little circle. That's a problem. That's what Satan likes. So he likes my circle to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And if it expands in numbers of people, he wants to make sure it's the people that will keep me in the middle of the circle, always looking at self. That everybody makes me feel better even advertised blatantly on our modern religious stations. You know, these stations that help us be better people, you know, in high definition and full color. These panels that can advertise us, help us to be good American people. You know, you should buy this product and make yourself feel better. You're worth it. Until eventually you get this all boiled down and all you are is this little dot. It's all about you. <clears throat> Let's pretend for a moment. Let's pretend that this I here was God. So if God was that way, where would you be? On the outside. <laughs> On the outside. He wouldn't be taking care of us at all, would he? So what we see here is this circle is a circle that helps us to grow. Now, if we want to, let's remove this part and let's expand a little more God's part. Okay, here I am. God loves me. And I'm supposed to what? Love I'll just put you, another person. And that would include God as well, wouldn't it? Okay? So I'm supposed to love too. So we have a relationship here. And we should also have a relationship here. And of course this relationship should go this way. So one of the ways, and we can redraw this now to make sense out of it. One of the ways that God helps you is by Him loving and empowering 
me, and I do the same for you. So some of the time, God will get things straight to you. Sometimes, he'll bring them through me. And you to me. So now what we get, and this is really fascinating. Remember that little dot we had on there? Now think about it. In God's situation, here's God over here, and here's all the yous in the world. To draw it two different ways here. There's people all over the world that God loves, and all of them are God's means of helping me. Isn't that interesting? So the more friends I have, Christian friends, that are connected to God, the more people God is using to empower me. And I'm doing the same for them. So we discover now that all of God's society is a network of people supporting each other instead of each one sinking alone. Now this brings up two things. How important is your connection between getting things from these people? If you separate yourself from them, can they give to you? How important is it then, secondly, to your growth for you to be giving to them? Well, it's very Because you have to accept in order to give it if you follow the theory. So basically, we need this going both ways. Because if I receive only, won't it kind of shut off? God's Word says, if you want to have friends, show yourself friendly. So it has to go both ways, doesn't it? It does. And we know in our relationship with God that as God helps me and I help someone else, that helps them to grow me. So I benefit when I give to you. It's more blessed to get than to receive. <laughs> no, wait a minute. That didn't work out. How does God say it? More blessed, More blessed, than, blessed to give than to receive. You see, we can't get and receive all the time. We have to give. Who's going to be doing the giving if everybody's doing the receiving? So my growth is about developing relationships. In your lesson, um, <clears throat> look at the key thought. Key thought. It's good to look at the key thought in a lesson because it helps you to see where you're headed. You know, it's kind of like getting a bigger picture, looking at Google before you get in the car and drive. You kind of know where you're going. It says, Christ's victory on the cross defines the script of the victory into which the Christian may grow. The scope of the victory into which the Christian can grow. Basically, what it is, is it exposes the principalities and powers of Satan. And in the process, God destroyed them, didn't he? In exposing Satan, he not only exposed him, but he brought him down. You see, Satan's empire was really built on secrecy and lies. Isn't that correct? Still doing a good job. He's still, still doing a good job. Well. How did he manage to get a third of the angels in heaven? By truth? No. They didn't understand, did they? No. Why did they not understand? Well, they had never encountered it before, and they had never uh, run into such opposition or a similar situation. They so, in other words, they didn't have the experience. So you're saying the angels didn't have the experience of being in sin or even observing it? Observing it, yes. They had any conception of it. Then I got a question for you, Joe. Okay. I got an answer. How in the world? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have to ask somebody else. It's going to be a right answer, but it's going to be If the angels were deceived because they didn't have experience with or know and see and observe sin, how can you make good choices about God if you've never seen perfection or experienced it? Well, I think I've seen on the stuff and reading his word in the scripture and everything because it speaks to you and it tells you basically what's right or wrong. 
you know, I just don't, I just don't think they, you know, they didn't have something like this to guide them. But God explained it to them. But see, you didn't answer my question. But you answered another question that was a good question, good answer. The question was, how can you do it? And the answer is, you can't. But what you did is you said, I'm assuming that I can, and here's how, and that's exactly correct. Because in reading God's Word, in listening to God's Word, in hearing it in the different ways, and what does it say? Faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by Word of God. the Word of God. <clears throat> so, just like the angels didn't know sin, it was off the church to them. It was an experience they didn't have, the knowledge they didn't have. The same is true of us. On God's side back here, we've never been in heaven. We've never seen God. We've never seen a perfectly working society. So Satan tries to keep us in the dark. Or that he's using that against us. So Jesus comes along and he exposes God. He reveals God that the purpose, one of the purposes in Jesus coming to earth was to reveal the Father, wasn't it? In other words, reveal divinity. What is heaven really like? And in that process, he also exposed the devil. In exposing the devil, two things happen. One, we said, oh, I don't like that little devil. So we saw him for what he was. Number two, in exposing the devil, he also provided a means for conquering him. And that was Jesus' death and resurrection. So now, now that we can see the character of God, now we can say, all right, God, I understand a little bit of it. I've seen a little bit of it. I choose it. And God says, good. Now that you've chosen it, I have a plan to help you to have it. Except, no, wait a minute. That's a big step. It's one thing for you and I to see something. It's another thing to be able to get your hands on it. For example, have you ever driven somewhere and see this big, expensive, just gorgeous, beautiful property? buildings, gates, and paved driveway, and just gorgeous, multi-million dollar property. You ever seen one? Yeah. You drive by and say, whoa, never saw one of those before. I like that. Well, that's all fine. That was easy. How do you get it? Any of you got one? Is it because you don't want one? Is that why you don't have it? No. no. It's because you haven't figured out the way to get it. You and I may have seen a little bit of God. And we see that and we say, God, you're right. That's what I want. But the critical part next is, how do I get it? And that's what growing up in Christ is all about, isn't it? The very last paragraph of, of your uh, Sabbath lesson there, as we seek to understand, you see that? Look what it says. This is deep. As we seek to understand what Christ has accomplished in our behalf, we will be better prepared to understand what we can have in our lives now. Too many Christians are looking to heaven. And folks, there is no heaven if you don't start living that lifestyle here. It starts here. Here is the testing ground. Think of it like school. Will you ever graduate and have a good job as a doctor if in school you can't perform the surgery, you can't remember the diseases, you don't know the symptoms, and you can't remember the medications for them? Are you ever going to graduate and be a doctor? Of course not. All of that skill starts in the classroom. After all, isn't that the purpose of the classroom? We are living the classroom experience. We're not living life here, folks. That's for heaven. What we're living now is our educational experience. 
We're learning how to live. When we get to heaven, then we can live. But we've got to start it here. We've got to start doing it. It's got to be a part of us now. Just like in school, you've got to have the knowledge in your head. You've got to start developing the skills. And then when you get out into practice, then you have your office and you start doing it. And yet there is a big lie <clears throat> that says we won't be given a second chance. Yeah, well, some of the medical people get a second chance. You know, they fail all their stuff, but somehow they get through, and then they get out there, and hopefully they'll learn it someday, but not on you or me. But, yeah, it is a big lie, isn't it? And the big lie is to think that you can graduate without learning it, and you'll get to learn it later. That's the big lie. Thank you. <clears throat> That's one. His victory can be our victory if we claim it for ourselves. Because no matter what Jesus has done for us, we must choose to accept it. Victory is not automatically given to anyone who simply desires it. So it's the choice that's important. <clears throat> redemption. Christianity is a religion of redemption. You know what I like to call it? Redemption is intervention. You know, in our society today, we get a lot of Hollywood people that make mistakes. Instead of sending them to jail, we send them to classes. You know, anger management or withdrawal <coughs> classes, you know, get you over the drugs. Well, it's intervention, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's somebody intervening to try and help you to grow. That's exactly what salvation is. God is intervening in our behalf to help us to be able to fight with the devil and change and grow. That's what salvation and growth is all about. So, when Christ came here, we said he came for two purposes. Show us God, and what was the second one? To save us. To actually provide a means for it to happen. Okay? So that once we saw him, chose him, now there's also a means to conquer him. Now the only way that God could provide a means to conquer Satan was for God to do what first? What was required for your salvation and mine? Now he has death and his resurrection. Okay, he had to take my place, didn't he? He had to take my place. See, the only way for you to be saved for eternity is to pay for your sin. Can you pay for your sin? No. What is the penalty of sin? Yeah. Can you die? Yes. Then you can't pay for your sin. Of course you can. Yeah, but I don't want to do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to do it that way? Because that means missing heaven, doesn't it? Yes. It means not having eternal life. Because we can pay for our sin, and we will. All sin is going to be paid for. Either with your life or Christ. And so when Christ came and paid the consequence of sin by dying and then living to give us life, he took my place. He had to do what is required Required for the consequence of sin. If you're lost, the agony of knowing that you're going to die for all eternity, that you're not going to get to live, that your life has prevented you from having eternal life, the agony, the terror of knowing that you're dying never to live again, it's over. He had to match that. He took mine, my agony, my terror, and yours, and everybody in this room, and everybody in the world. Have you ever taken the punishment for somebody else? Have you ever been punished for something you didn't do and you know who did it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. How'd it feel? Oh, I <laughs> I would rather pay the consequence of my own mistake. Don't make me take yours. Do you feel that way? Mm -hmm. 
But Jesus volunteered to do that. Have you ever paid a consequence that two people did and you got punished for both of them? That's double angry. Now how about millions of people? That's what Jesus did. He reveals his character. I'm sorry? He reveals his character. It's it did reveal his him. character. Well, doesn't that make you want to love him? He's mm -hmm. like, he was willing to do that? He didn't feel any anger when he did it, though. It wasn't Gosh. anger. No, it was just the pain of sin. This is what sin does. Horribleness of sin. You know what's what's so beautiful is the scripture says that it pleased God to allow his son to die for our sins. It pleased God. I mean that's that's deep to think that it that it gave God joy to have his son die on the cross. The son in Isaiah, if you want me to read it, Isaiah. For the benefit of what? For the benefit of us. It's not that he wanted Jesus to die. But it pleased him to do that so that he could have a... In other words, he gladly traded his son for you. And that would never be done. <laughs> no. In our human nature that we were talking about in this little circle, we would never go outside the circle and say, I'll die for you. It's not in our nature to do that. Go to the book of Romans. The next several days of study is in the book of Romans, and I want to just take some time here and look at these verses because what Paul wrote here is so incredibly clear of what is, what is needed for us to grow. Romans chapter 6, and we'll just take a few sections at a time here and read some of this. Someone read verses 1 through 4. We'll start with that. Romans 6, verses 1 to 4. Shall we? What shall, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Okay. What happened here in those verses? What did Jesus do? What did he do? Died. Okay. He died. And then he... Is he dead? No. Okay. He rose. Is that the right spelling for that rose? More than one rose? He died and he rose again. For you, now this is me over here, because of my sin, I will have to what? But I can't be living life if I'm dead, so I must. I must rise. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, I am going to do this. Everyone's going to do this. The question is, which one of these are you going to do? And which one of these do you get? Sinners are going to die and be dead for all eternity. They'll rise for a judgment and die again for all eternity. Or, I can die to self. Surrender. Commitment. I can die to self. And then I can be raised again by who? God. He will give me a new life. I'm dying to my sinful life. And then he will give me a new spiritual life. Okay? I will die. Period, folks. Get that into your head. We're all going to die. We're either going to die physically for all eternity, 
or we're going to die to self so that we can be raised to a new life and live through all eternity. Amen. It's one or the other. There is no third option. And there is no second chance. All right, so what he's saying here, notice verse 4 again, therefore we were buried with him through baptism. We died this death to self when we accepted Christ and were baptized. Now he says, look, you understand surrender and dying to self. That little circle we have of being all cooped up in ourselves, he says that has to break. So you die to self. You die to the, your own interests, your own desires. You die to your own natural inclinations. And you say, okay, God, you come in and give me a new life. You give me new attitudes, give me new thinking, give me new goals, give me new purposes, give me new ways of looking at myself, which is more realistic, and others. You're going to give me this new life. And notice what he says here. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should walk in newness of life. So he says, you're supposed to have a new life too. Is Jesus dead now? No. No. What kind of a life is he living? A God life. Not a sin life. Well, when you and I, born in sin, die to self, we are to have a resurrection. He says, just as surely as you die, just as surely as repentance is required for salvation, so is living a new life. You see what he's saying here? He said, you can't die to self and not live for Christ and call that Christianity. He says, it doesn't work. All right? Verses 5 through 8. Joe, do you want to read those parts, please? For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. <clears throat> For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Now there he's kind of repeating it, saying it another way. He says, just as surely as you died, you have to be resurrected. If you died, you don't have your old life. But you need a new one. If you're still physically alive, then spiritually, if you died to your old sinful nature, then he says, don't you need a new one? He says, it's supposed to be dead. Now, are we truly converted if we die to Christ and yet the old man lives? He says, no. No. You're, you're not living that new life. Now, I think maybe it's a little akin to... Something my sister said one time, we were talking on the phone, and we were talking about how, you know, we can take our problems and difficulties and all this stuff to Christ. And in prayer, we take them to Him and we lay them at His feet. But she says, too often, when our prayer gets done, we gather them all back up and go off with them. Hey, that's not being raised in Christ, is it? So, Where's the new life? If we do that, we must move beyond that and actually live the new life. Now, this, this concept flies right in the face of a lot of Christianity today. It's everywhere. It's just rampant. You come to Christ, you die to Him, and they don't talk about this part. Salvation is two parts. Surrender and living. Now, if we didn't put you underground when you did this dying, if we did not put you underground and you're still out walking around, what life are you living? It's either the old or the new. It's one or the other, isn't it? The flesh or the spirit. Yes. So if I'm not living the new life, the spiritual life, 
then am I dead to sin? No. Apparently I was resurrected to my sin. The flesh is alive and well. Very alive and well. All right, let's read verses 10 through 14. Who wants to read? Jeff, please. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Oh boy, law, grace. Here we are, back to that one. When you die and you're dead, are you under the law? For instance, I have a wife. We have a contract. We stood in front of people in front of a church and each agreed. And there was a termination clause in that contract. What's the termination clause? Till death do us part. If she dies, Am I obligated to her? After she dies? After she's dead. Because she's not here for me to fulfill it. How can I? She's not here. If I die to sin, the law that condemned me for disobeying it, if I am dead to my sin, am I under the condemnation, am I under the obligation of that law? No. no. But then I was resurrected, though. I have a new life. So I'm not dead, dead. I'm still living. My heart's beating. Am I under the obligation of the law? Well, no, because you're resurrected under Christ and stuff under. So I don't have to keep the law. No. No, it's not. When you're in Christ Jesus, you're not under the condemnation of the law. You're well, that's because I was forgiven, though. Because he forgave me. But what about my new life now? Well, sin's not going to rule over you anymore if you... You're living by grace. If you, if you stay surrendered to Christ Jesus Christ, yeah, and allow him to sin. live in you and give you the power to live a... Overcoming life, overcoming sin. sin. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying I have to keep the law, but it can't something. What are you telling me? <laughs> the word is growing. <laughs> when you're resurrected, you're living. Under the grace, the laws are etched in your mind and heart, so you automatically always do what's right. Okay. If you're um, surrendered yeah. to the Spirit of God and have Him dwelling within you. Well, you wouldn't be in heaven if you weren't surrendered. Um. What is that? Condemnation. What does that mean? To condemn someone. Guilty verdict. Guilty of it? Passed on you. You've, you've broken and you're condemned by it? Okay, so if I die to sin and I'm resurrected to a new life, is it about condemnation anymore? No. No, because he tells us that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. So even if I sin over here, I can be forgiven right away. If we ask for it, we're here. Okay, so I can live without condemnation except for split moments, what the time it takes between the sin and the forgiveness. 
So my record stays pretty clean, doesn't it? If there's no buildup here. That's in your sins when you realize we have the Holy Spirit that makes us aware of it. But you, you are under the condemnation of the law if you don't confess and repent and give God an opportunity to forgive you of your sins and to take that condemnation away. Which is where I was here. Exactly. I was under constant condemnation. But I don't need to be here. But you're telling me I have to keep the law. But there's something I am not over here. And this is where they get mixed up. I am not under the There's what it means when it says, I'm not under the law. I'm not under the control of the law. Doesn't mean the law went away. It can't control me. I love it when you're driving down the freeway and you see a big sign up. Uh, speed controlled by radar. That's not the phraseology. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Your radar never stopped me from speeding. <laughs> I can drive as fast as I want to. You can't control it with a radar. Now, radar enforced, yes. He could stop me from doing it, right? But his radar won't make my car stay under the speed limit. You see what I'm saying? Over here, let me start over here. Over here, before I die, prior to this experience, in my sinful nature, I am under the control of sin. I cannot help it. I toyed and decided not to do it, but maybe it's a good assignment for you to do at home. Take a piece of paper and list everything you cannot do. As a human being, cannot do it. You cannot do it. I cannot keep from sinning. I cannot change my heart. I cannot even desire God. I cannot search for God. I cannot overcome sin. I cannot repent of sin. I cannot any of those folks. But God's the one pursuing me. And because God pursues me, he puts it in my heart to do it. And I can respond to it and do it. But I can't put it in there. I cannot give myself the desire to do right. But God can give it to me. I can choose it when he gives it to me. But I can't desire it. Any of you have the little book, Steps to Christ or Happiness Digest? Um, Jeff, next week, let's make sure everybody's got one. Let's do that. That book is so phenomenal in 90 pages, whatever. It's so phenomenal in walking through what our sin condition is, what God can do for me, and how he does that. Because, folks, we can't do it. When you recognize that you are lost, you didn't figure that out. You remember somebody on the news said something about if you've got an expensive business, you didn't do that? <laughs> Well, politically, I don't agree with that. <clears throat> but any statement you want to make, almost, about your spiritual life and your growth, you can say, but I didn't do that. God has to do it. Now, there is something for you to do. In fact, I'll be talking about that in the sermon this morning. It's interesting, the correlation between what I've been preaching and the, and the lesson. Because uh, I was just continuing in the Bible from where we were. Now, in Romans, where are we here? 8.38. Let's, let's go up there. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. <clears throat> Time's running out on us here. We'd like to read verses 38 and 39 to us, please. Okay, Charlie? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. Can you be separated from God? Mm -hmm. Can you? If we 
choose or we can. We have to choose. Is there anything that can separate you from God? Yeah. What? What can separate you from God? I'm looking at it. It's you. It's you. Only you. No thing. He says there's neither height nor depth. There's nothing in the world that can come between you and God. It cannot get in there and shove you apart. It's entirely up to you. Period. If you have a friend, there is nothing that can separate you from that friend. If you two decide to be friends, nothing can separate you. It's only in your own thinking or their thinking that will break that relationship. That's what he's talking about here. Sin, things of life, nothing can prevent you from having a relationship with God. If you don't have one, it's your choice. Now, after God has gone so far as to send his son to this earth, Christ has gone so far as to die for you and be resurrected, go back to heaven. He's still working there for you, sends his Holy Spirit here to work for you, sends, empties all of heaven to work for you. Is he going to walk away from you? No. Of course not. Tell me which sin it is that is so big that you can commit, or tell me how many times you can commit it, commit it to cause God to quit loving you. None. There isn't such a thing, is there? No. Love is bigger than sin, folks. Come on. Did Satan cause something to happen that's bigger than God's love? No. Of course not. Of course not. So let's just get that out of our minds, okay? So God's love is not too small to keep on loving me. There is nothing in the universe that can come between me and him. Don't have to worry about that. The only thing we have to worry about is my choice. My choice. Because as long as I'm willing to choose him, there's nothing that can separate me from him. Going back to chapter 4, Galatians 4. Now, this is kind of a long section here, verses 1 to 11, as you saw it in our, in our lesson study on Wednesday. We won't read all of that. But he talks about Abraham, uh, Abraham's righteousness that was apart from what? Abraham was righteous, but it was not because of his what? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm in Romans. I didn't turn to Galatians. This is part of it. It's not the one I wanted. Thank you, thank you. It says that he believed God and that was accounted unto him for righteousness. Okay. Okay, in Galatians 4, verses 1 to 11, if I get myself in the right place, it says, Now I see that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not what? Yeah. Differ from what? What's a slave? Slave or servant? What are they? Okay. Somebody in bondage. They, they have to do what they're told to do. They do not have freedom. Okay. As sinners, we are slaves. We have to sin. You're required to sin. As a sinner, you're required to sin. That's what sinners do. You see, it's kind of like an orange tree. It's required to bear oranges. It's not required to bear grapefruit. Nor avocados. Why? God, that's an orange tree. And that's what they have to do. And if they don't, what do we do to them? We say, you're not even an orange tree. Get out of here. Yeah. So when we are sinners, we're required to sin. But if we die... And we're resurrected. We say, now I'm a Christian. What's the requirement? Well, you're still alive, so you're going to serve God, right? Bear the fruit of a Christian. Bear the fruit of a Christian. 
And you say, yeah, but I'm a sinner. No, you were. The law does not have control. It doesn't mean you're not supposed to follow the law. It means the law doesn't control you. Your inability to do it doesn't control you. Your nature doesn't cause you to violate it. You're free to obey the law. You don't have to to be a Christian. You don't have to bear oranges to be an orange tree. You bear oranges because you are. Because you are. Okay. Big difference, isn't there? I never had to go out and tell my orange tree, now you have to bear oranges. Envelope's right over there in that table. No, I've never gone out and told my orange tree, now this year you have to bear oranges. In fact, I have some avocado bushes, trees, whatever, and they're not bearing avocados. And I don't think my going out and having a long, hard conversation with them is going to change that. Do you? If they don't bear avocados, they don't bear avocados. The reality is it takes them seven to ten years to do that. And it's not that old yet. So having a talk with it isn't going to change it. But what he talks about here is that when we were slaves of sin, we're similar to an heir that is too young, a minor. The minor, even though he will inherit the farm, everything the family has, he doesn't have it, he has no control over it, he makes no decisions about it when he's a minor. But once we come of age, once you and I surrender to God, once you and I mature, and we die to self, and we're resurrected in Christ, now we become heirs. Can you imagine an heir to a throne or a great amount of wealth acting like a servant? What would people think? They'd say, he doesn't deserve it. Take it away from him. What can God do? If we, aren't, if we aren't heirs in fact, if we don't serve him in fact, it'll be taken from us. Because we aren't his people. We aren't living this way. We're still living back here. Okay. And we didn't get to Thursday, did we? We'll take it up next week. All right, let's pray. Our time is up. We'll start with Thursday's lesson next week. Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for making the provision that though we were sinners, yet we can live according to your principles and your law. Bless us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be renewed every day, every moment in our life for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.